I greet the Holy Spirit, author and finisher of my faith. I greet my pastor, Reverend Dr. Williams, my fellow watchmen on the kingdom wall, all officers in your respective offices, and greetings to you, my friends and family at the Holy Remnant Apostolic Church. For you who are joining us for the first time, you're at the right place. Welcome to our Bible study. I am Dr. Sharon Clark. Tonight, we'll be journeying under the topic, Woe is me, flowing from Isaiah 9, uh, from Isaiah 6, sorry, 1 to 9. It reads thus. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, I and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto the other, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in the and the post of the door opened, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said, Hi, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this had touched my lips, thine lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Father God, you are God and God alone. Lord, when we are in our situation, there's only one person to call on, and that is you. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much that when we're in our situation, you will send an angel, oh God, to take us out of our situation, to guide, lead, and direct us from the path that we are in. And Father, let us be reminded, oh God, that tonight, whatever we study, the things that we say, cause it, I'm asking you to come out the way we, we studied it, the way you, import, you poured it in me so I can pour it out to your people. Father, I ask for clarity. I ask for understanding. I ask that your people will hear, and that even one, O oh God, will hear the word as it is said, and it was deposited in me. Then, Father, it is a study well done. Thank you, God, for what you have done and all you continue to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Woe is me. Isaiah 6 laid out a profound narrative of transforming, transformation and mission. It's a stark reminder of God's holiness, the reality of human sinfulness, and the grace God extends upon even in judgment. This chapter challenges us to consider our own response to God's call, inviting self-examination, repentance, and willing service. Today, as, aside from my focus verses, I have broken down this chapter into three possible study points. Verse 1 to 4, the scene of the vision. Verse 5 to 8, the per, my purging. Verses 9 to 12, 
my commission. Or you could say the purging and the commission. Whether it's a vision or we are fully awake during the experience, I ask that you put yourself in Isaiah's place. Think how frightening and odd it must have been for him to be all the vision of the Lord, to undergo his purification, to volunteer for this commission, knowing he was about to speak to some ardent arts, he will have to tell them that the Lord declared blindness to come upon, to come upon the Jewish nation and the destruction which would follow. Are you prepared or are you ready to say, send me, should this be your encounter? Let us take a deeper look at my topic, woe is me. It is recorded that the word woe is found 92 times in the Bible with 67 verses located in the Old Testament and 25 in the New Testament. The phrase, woe is me, is often used to express grief, despair, or lamentation. Woe, in the biblical definition, is more than just an utterance. Whether in Greek, Hebrew, or English, this word serves as an exclamation of anguish, of distress, or of grief. The use of woe in the, bibic, in the biblical type, typically, sorry, I repeat. The use of woe in the Bible typically carries strong emotional references. In the Old Testament, the word is often used to describe the judgment of God against sinners. In the New Testament, the, road, the word woe is often used by Jesus to describe the spiritual condition of people who are far from God. Growing up on the island, as many of you who were listening may or may not remember, usually when we hear the elders, the older people, when we hear them said, whoa, if you, f if you didn't finish such, or if you didn't f finish such, a woe it's going to be if you didn't do that or if you didn't do this. And when we hear that, when we hear such a, a warning, it is never good. We know that there will be a penalty to pay if we did not do what we we're supposed to do. It was no different in the Bible days. Please note here, some of the most notable biblical reference to this phrase. In Job 10.15, the phrase, woe unto me, is used to express Job's distress and grief. Luke 6, 24 to 26, Jesus said, but woe to you who are rich, Woe to you when all people speak well of you. In these verses, Jesus is warning against the temptation of pride and self-righteousness. The word woe indicates that unless we repent of our sinfulness and turn to God, we will face eternal damnation. As we can see in the, earlier, in the first verse, it shows that the angels, the seraphims, they cried one unto the other, holy, holy, holy. But look how they did it. They covered. They covered their faces. They used their wings to cover their faces. Then they bowed down because the glory of the Lord, even in heaven, is still so much for one to be old. Biblically, woe is often used as a warning or a sign of impending judgment. 
Consequently, woe is often used as a warning. The word woe should cause us to cause and reflect upon our relationship with God. Here are five of such points. Point one, in grief, woe is used to express profound sadness in the face of loss. You can see Isaiah 6, 5. As a warning, the term woe often appears as a caution against wrongdoing. You can read that in Isaiah 3, 9. Number three, woe as an exclamation of suffering. People can also use woe as a forceful exclamation of suffering, crying out in deep anguish from the heart. See Jeremiah 15, 10. Woe as a self-reflection. Woe can also inspire reflection. When we read woe to me, it prompts us to ask, to, ask, to assess our actions and attitudes. See 1 Corinthians 9, 16. When we, when we use woe, expressing regret, that's number five. Woe, expressing regret. We can also express regret or lamentation over past actions. It reflects a sense of sorrow and remorse for making the wrong choice. You can see Lamentation 5.16. Listed here are some examples of woes in the Bible. Moab, great city. There was a woe, but there was also a promise. When we hear in the Bible where wickedness is concerned, there's a woe. There's a woe for, my, for souls. There's a woe for my wounds. There's a woe when the call of Eve, call against evil. There's a woe when they're mighty in drink or strong drink. False prophets, pastors that destroy, foolish women, scribes and Pharisees. There's a woe in the Bible when some of these are mentioned. These examples demonstrate the range of emotion and the situation that can be expressed through the phrase, woe is me. This phrase have a deep tone in the human experience of pain and loss. It can be a cry of personal guilt and a cry of shame, a lament, a lament for one's circumstances. It can be a lament when we're in a certain situation, whether this situation was inflicted on us or it is self-inflicted, because we sometimes put ourselves in some situations and when we really realize too late, then we will cry, woe, woe is me. And we also cry, woe, when in mourning, in the suffering of, a, of lost. We mourn, we cry, woe, when we suffer the loss of a, of a loved one. Woe is a cry that comes from the depths of our soul, from the depths of our heart. When we cry, woe, it means that we are suffering on the inside. Why do we experience woe? We experience woe when we sense that something precious has been taken from us. Or when we realize that something especially, especially important, when we're expecting something and it did not come, when we're expecting something big, 
something that would make a big difference in our life, and we did not get it. Whether because, again, whether it's because of somebody's, uh, somebody's doing or something that we did that we should have done it the other way. And when we, what we're expecting, then we realize that it's not going to happen. And we're in a bind. We're in a deep situation where we need that thing to come through for us. That's a woe. Woe. Woe may also come when woe also be felt when we ponder our own mortality or the death of someone close to us. That's right. When we go to the doctor and they said, you have X time or X time, or you go to the doctor and they give you that earth shattering result from the tests you some test that was run that my friends cause you to ponder your mortality in isaiah 6 5 the prophet isaiah see a vision of god's throne and declare woe is me for i am lost for i am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This was a powerful, a very powerful expression of Isaiah's unworthiness. This was a very powerful expression of his, sin, of his sinfulness in the presence of God. In Psalms 120, verse 5, the psalmist laments. He said, Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, and I dwell among the tents of Kadar. Meshach and Kadar were both real regions associated with hostility and conflict. So the psalmist was covering, was conveying his distress of being surrounded by his enemy. Woe is me, because I sojourn. Sometimes you find out that you go to the wrong place at the wrong time. Sometimes some situation happen, and the police report is saying, wrong place at the wrong time. And it left us in woe. As I say this, my heart... As I say this, my heart tremble because today, after so many years, my family still live with that. Wrong place at the wrong time, but we still live with that woe. We sojourn. Wrong place, wrong time. Whoa. In Jeremiah 4, 31, the prophet mourns, for I hear a cry as a woman in labor, anguish as one giving birth to her first child, the cry of the daughter of Zion gasping for breath, stretching out her hands, woe is me. I am fainting before murderers. This is a graphic image of the suffering and this desperation of the people of Judah in the face of aggression and destruction. I hear a cry as a woman in labor. And my friends, I can tell you sometimes when you pass that room or when you go near that room, some, the anguish that some you'll hear coming from that room, a woman in labor. And here we are saying, yes, we know at the end of that labor, they're going to be a beautiful bundle of joy in your hand. But here we're talking about the cry of the daughter of Zion gasping for breath, stretching out her hand. Woe is me. I am fainting before murderers. Hallelujah. 
in the New Testament, we find woe is me just once. And this carried a different tone. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, the apostle Paul declared, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity, necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is upon me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is upon me if I preach the wrong thing to God's people. Woe is upon me if I do not tell, if I do not tell of the consequences that relates to sin. Woe if I do not preach the gospel, the gospel of truth, the gospel of love, the gospel of judgment, the gospel of Christ coming back. He came for sinners. He came so he may save the sinners. He came so he may stretch out on Calvary's cross, suspended between earth and heaven, took on our sin. Woe if we do not preach that gospel because when he come again, he will not be riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. He'll be coming on the great horse. He'll be coming. He is coming back. Woe unto preachers who preach prosperity gospel instead of judgment. Woe for them who put revelation aside. This is what Paul is talking about. Hallelujah. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Here, woe to me expresses the urgency and the accountability placed upon believers to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. The transition from the Old Testament desperate cry to the New Testament's gospel proclamation is a testament to the transformative power of Jesus' sacrifice. His, re his redemption substitute is paired with hope, giving salvation to all who is willing to accept. This change delivers an extreme message. It says, faith in Jesus Christ, open the path from woe to blessings. Faith in Jesus Christ opens the path from woe to blessings. Thank you, Jesus. My observation. Isaiah accepts the task willingly, despite knowing that the Israelites will not fully understand or perceive what he was telling them. Isaiah questioned how long this condition of spiritual blindness would persist. The Lord's response, response indicates that it will continue until the cities and the land are utterly devastated. But there was a glimmer of hope. A remnant will re remain. All would not be lost. No matter what happened, a remnant will always remain. Only remnant. Do you hear that? Are you counting yourself among that remnant? Are you willing to go beyond the name of your church to make sure you are counted among that remnant? My conclusion. Isaiah's vision highlights the need for redemption, regardless of our unworthiness. Because remember the word, the word of God said, when we, when we cannot get the, the, um, forgive ourselves, we, do, we call ourselves unworthy. He said we are worthy. So we just got to make sure, regardless of how we feel, God 
is greater than our art. And when he said we are worthy, we are worthy. I'm talking to you now, the prodigals. To you, the unsaved. To you, the religious but lost. Many will hear the sound of God's word, but won't feel the power of it until it's too late. God will perceive his church. He, God will, he will, he will perceive his church. He will put it under, under the up the place under the net under his coverage he will preserve his church that's my word god will preserve his church therefore the taking away of sin is necessary repentance is necessary your repentance is necessary because it en it enables you to go to God in prayer through Jesus Christ and speak with confidence and comfort. And to hear from God, to preach his forgiveness of sin to those who became aware of sin as a burden. God will speak to you so you can speak to others who like you find that your sin, who like me, who realized that my sin was a burden. So I go to him in repentance. You can go to him in repentance. And he will speak to you. And with this, my friends, the danger, the danger of being lost will not be there anymore. Because the Father, my friends, how great God is. This, the Father is waiting for you. He is waiting with open arms to receive you. In whatever state you're in, he is waiting. Why don't you accept him today? Why don't you come to him now? Let's go to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, God of all creation, woe is me for I am undone. And that is why, Father God, I ask that when I go to the altar and I will stay at the altar of sacrifice and praise and know that, God, you will work through me. I'm a, I'm a working proce process. I am undone. And for everything that I've done, Father, that is not of you, I ask your forgiveness. And I ask today, go forth, God, for everyone who is within the sound of my voice, whether it's today or years to come, that they will hear these words and they will know that there's a war. There is a war for when the day of judgment come and we are not standing in repentance. There's a war, but we also know that you, you're, you are there willing to take us from war to mercy. You're there to take us from woe to grace. All we got to do is say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your ways. This, Father God, we are standing in the assurance that you, you are the promise keeper and everything that you promise, you promise. You said you'll never leave your children nor forsake them. And with that, God, we're trusting on you and we're trusting in you that your words cover us and your words will lead us, will cause the, your words, Father, to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Keep us grounded in the words so that, oh, Father, when that day come, woe is me, will not be the word we say, but we'll say, thank you, Jesus. Here I am. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next time, my friends, stay safe, stay blessed. Good night.